and I was standing in my kitchen and I heard about this new disease among gay men in Los Angeles. And it was Michael Gottlieb, of course, reporting the first cases of pneumocystis. And that was probably in February or March of 1981. Uh, I was then, at that point, running the dermatology inpatient service. In those days, we admitted patients with dermatolo dermatological problems to the hospital. And I was called to see a young nurse, uh, Bobby Campbell, who became extremely well known. And this young man uh, had the worst case of shingles, of zoster you've ever seen. And he was 32, I believe, at the time. And as his history was taken, he had had sex with literally hundreds of people, which was an eye-opener to the medical community, an eye-opener to me, and we didn't know why he had shingles. Uh, that same patient came to me um, in September, and he had been hiking in the Pinnacles in the central part of the state of California with his boyfriend, and he had bruises on the instep of both feet and he was concerned about these bruises. And by that time, I'd already seen cases of Kaposi sarcoma, but I had never diagnosed a case myself. I'd seen cases that had been diagnosed by others and referred to me at the university and recognized that this was Kaposi sarcoma. The lesions came on very suddenly and um, literally overnight in some cases. Uh, and they went through a progression. Early on, they would be slightly pink, flat, lesions on the body, and they could be anywhere. They could be a single lesion at the corner of your eye or multiple lesions on your back. Uh, they often were bilaterally symmetrical. If you had it on one foot, you'd have it on the other foot. A very weird phenomena. Um, and then the lesions over time would become more raised, we say nodular, and the color would darken. They would almost become the color of Sauvignon Blanc. It would be a deep purple color. Now early on, all of the cases of KS were missed by their general practitioners. No one had any idea. Kaposi sarcoma, before the AIDS epidemic, was so rare that they were estimated at about 52 cases in the entire United States every year. The average dermatologist was expected to see one case in a lifetime. And so suddenly we started seeing these young men, all of whom were gay, who had these purple lesions. And of course, the doctors were missing the diagnosis and we started, I started the Kaposi Sarcoma Clinic at the university to see these patients, biopsy them, make the diagnosis, and try to begin to understand you know, what was causing this disease. It caused this aggressive, these purple lesions that would grow, in some cases become almost, people's legs might become like looking like tree trunks. Um, it became so bad, people would get it all over their face. Um, in some cases, it caused blockage of the lymphatics, so you get people with these huge swollen faces look like pumpkins. Uh, it was a horrible thing, and it was the identifier of, a of AIDS for many people. We still didn't know what was causing the disease. It was not called AIDS at this time. It was still called the gay plague or um, GRID, gay-related immunodeficiency syndrome. With the help of a pharmaceutical company, we present, pr uh, produced a small brochure and we handed it out at the Moscone Center for the first meeting of the American Academy of Dermatology. And many doctors would refuse to take them, saying, I don't want to know anything about this thing. I don't, we don't have those people in my community. I will never see this disease. A theme we heard over and over and over. That was when we began to realize th this is you know, going to really be difficult because doctors were reassuring patients, oh, that's a bruise, don't worry about it, you know. And of course, doctors in that period were not even asking patients if they were gay. 84 was pretty, still pretty crazy time. You know, there was no test. Um, people were dying, but it was basically, you know, you got diagnosed when you got sick. That was the only way. You know, some people had swollen lymph glands, some people were losing some weight, but for the most part, people would get sick and die. I had a friend in San Francisco, I remember, uh, I didn't even know he was infected, and I got a call, I got a message on my desk saying, you know, JP called, Tad's dead. And he had gone in the hospital two days before. Um, he, he, nobody knew who had the virus. He went in the hospital, he had aggressive, you know, um, central nervous system lymphoma, and he was dead in two days. That's what used to happen. 
Gary and I had heard about this gay cancer, and a friend of mine from my days at the Legal Aid Society um, called us and told us that he had a lesion and was in the hospital with pneumonia. And uh, we went to the hospital to see him and uh, understood what was going on. We got to talk to some of the doctors and, and, uh, and the nurses, and I don't have to tell you that uh, we would have to go with a couple of other friends um, um, and uh, serve him his meals and make sure he got his injections. I had a friend who was a nurse, and I would ask uh, her to go over and to make sure that he got his medications because everybody was afraid to go near him. I have to say, honestly, the very first reaction was fear. Fear. Is it me next? How is this transmitted? Fear. Um, shock. Shock, I mean, suddenly, um, uh, as I say, by 82, we were going to funerals already for people in their 20s and 30s, and, and, um, and, and every day the phone was ringing with somebody else telling us that they were sick. It just seemed like everybody died, everybody from one to another. You cannot grieve enough, fat, and you can't grieve fast enough, so to speak, to, um, to um, keep up with all the people who deserve to be grieved. It was a hard time. The idea that in my 30s, uh, we're dealing with constant death, that you can't do anything about. It's not like somebody goes out and gets hit by a car. You're dealing with ongoing deaths all around you that you can't, you can't grapple with. I mean, it's a, it's a, uh, psychologically at some point, someone will write about what that does to a generation. The homophobia was rampant. And so, of course, that meant that most gay men chose to keep their sexuality totally closeted. They simply would not come out. The first case in San Francisco of a transfusion-associated AIDS case was a baby. The baby had no risk factors for AIDS. You know, he, he was a brand new baby. He wasn't gay. He wasn't an IV drug user. He wasn't Haitian. Why did he have AIDS? And yet he got AIDS and died. And the only thing that they could find was that he had had a transfusion shortly after birth. So they tracked down the donor of the transfusion, and he swore that he had never had sex with another man. And his doctor swore that he had never had sex, the man had never had sex. There was no evidence that this man had any inclinations toward being gay. After the man died, about six months later, a family member called the public health officials and said, we have found some memorabilia in his closet that would suggest that perhaps he had some gay interests. And so the city health department, to their great credit, went to literally every doctor in the city and said, have you seen this man as a patient? And they found, finally found a doctor who had, and it treated him for rectal gonorrhea. Now there's only one way you get rectal gonorrhea, and that's from receptive anal sex. And so the man was having receptive anal sex, he was gay, but he had denied it until his death. His doctor, supposedly someone that he could confide in with complete confidence, did not know this. His family did not know it. And the reason for that was not that he was an evil man. It was that that was the atmosphere that prevailed. You had to pretend that you were straight. The blood banks infected 28,000 people with HIV because, quote, those kinds of people don't donate blood. And the blood bankers were complacent in that they believed that the people who were gay were either ribbon clerks who were so nelly that no, any fool could figure out they were probably gay. These were the brave ones who'd come out as teenagers and were just flaunting their sexuality. Or the leather queens who were all decked out with chains and piercings everywhere. It's true, those kind of people weren't walking into blood banks. But the vast majority of the gay community 
was and still is a population that looks just like you and me. Nobody knew what caused it and whether or not it was sexually transmitted. There were a lot of theories about it at first. Um, one of the most lo logical ones, really, and, and I entertained this for a while as, as a possibility, was poppers. Because epidemiologists would sort of look to see, well, what is it that gay people are doing that is different from what everybody else is doing? And one thing was poppers. I mean, this was like the high watermark of poppers. You would go into nightclubs and discos, and people would just be <laughs> sitting there with these bottles of, you know, amyl nitrate, butyl nitrate under their noses. Well, if that caused some sort of horrible immune thing and caused your immune system to collapse, that would make sense. So there was just this dearth of information um, about it, and most people are not trained in epidemiology or virology and understand. I mean, epidemiologists saw right away, they saw right away that the way that HIV was spreading in the population mirrored exactly the way that hepatitis B was spreading in the gay population, and they had been charting the spread of hepatitis B very carefully since 1978. So they saw that, and then they looked at this, and it was moving the same exact way through the population. And so the, the consensus solidified very early on amongst epidemiologists that it was sexually transmitted and that it was a virus. Over the next five to 10 years, more, as more and more patients came in who were suffering from KS or the other opportunistic infections that patients developed, the number of doctors who were caring for them was very, very limited. They would be referred to my practice or other doctors who were caring for AIDS patients, but the, the major community wouldn't take care of them. And I quit doing dermatology exclusively and went back to doing primary care, practicing like a GP, because no one would take my patients after they were diagnosed with KS. You could not get a doctor who would follow them. And the government's response was very strange. There was a very, very well-known activist from New York, Jenny Apuzo, and Jenny and I and some others went to Capitol Hill to testify. Testified before Waxman's committee, this was probably in 82, maybe it's early 83, about the problem, how many people were contracting the problem, about the spread of the problem. We were trying to get $40,000, not $40 million, $40,000, uh, and we were just batting our head against a wall. Um, we then met with the then Secretary of Health and Human Services, Brandt, very nice man from Oklahoma, I believe, and we're all sitting around in the room with the door closed talking to him about this is going to be a huge problem. This thing is not going to stay confined to a couple of little I islands in the United States. It's going to be all over the country because, sure, a man may be gay and living in Louisiana, but he's gonna to go to New Orleans or San Francisco and he's gonna contract this disease and go home to somewhere in, in, you know, in, in Louisiana and disseminate the disease. And Brandt said at that point, he had never met a homosexual before. So that was the response of the government. The Reagan administration would not touch it. And the CDC, which was charged with this very kind of thing, you know, we had an institution that was set up to identify an epidemic and respond to it, and that institution still exists, did not really respond as they should. He said it once. He, he said AIDS one time in one speech toward the end of his administration. I wrote him a letter at one point pointing out how many people were getting it and the, the necessity of the government to speak out and to step forward. And, that uh, you know, the free market might work great, except with unusual things like this, and this is why we have governments, and his government needs to do something. I got a very nice note back, which I still have, saying that Nancy and I are so pleased that you're supporting our administration. The inaction of the medical community, the non-action and inaction of the government was outrageous. When I was in the Koch administration, we had uh, uh, Legionnaire's disease, and I was running the task force for that in the health department. I can't tell you how quickly we mobilized. I can't tell you. 24 hours a day we were there. We had the mayor. We had the city council president. We had the health commissioner. We had people from CDC up there. And AIDS, or in those days GRID, nothing. When um, a GMHC uh, wanted to have its, uh, its a meeting early 
in its creation with the mayor to start talking about governmental reaction to this crisis and and the reaction of doctors and city hospitals and and medical personnel you know the trays were being left in a hallway and and uh, uh, bedpans weren't being cleaned i mean th there were some very basic things that weren't even being discussed the administration refused to have that meeting. And when a meeting was ultimately held, it was held in the basement of, uh, of City Hall downstairs, and it was held with one of the mayor's assistants. Our initial meetings were with the mayor's liaison to the gay community. It wasn't being treated as an issue of medical crisis, but as an issue of uh, the gay community. It was just perceived as a gay men's disease and, and, and drug, IV drug users. And uh, we were considered disposable. The first formal response that was organized was the gay men's health crisis in New York, which was founded in Larry Kramer's living room. It focused almost immediately on the caregiving side the bearing witness, the caregiving, the sort of meals on wheels, that kind of thing, taking care of people, because suddenly the, the population of people with AIDS in New York and in San Francisco and other cities with big gay populations was doubling every few months. It was just doubling and doubling and doubling and doubling. Um, and so the, and, and, and there was just a gigantic need for, for caregiving. Hospitals did not want to administer. Doctors and nurses didn't even want to touch people with AIDS. So we had to do this ourselves. We had to take care of people. We had no choice. It was us or no one. And so it was a daily chore, a daily chore. Um, I used to stay up at night and, uh, and uh, make soup and bake cookies. Um, every night, and then the next day I would make the rounds of all the people I knew who were sick, and some of them were people I'd never met before, but nobody else was there, so we had no choice. All we really had was the buddy system. You know, we took care of each other. That's what it was all about. The fact that it was, that it was striking gay men, sexually active gay men, um, was leading a lot of people to think that, okay, well, maybe sex, maybe gay sex is a bad thing and should be avoided. And I think, uh, you know, gay activists were very, very um, protective of uh, the progress that, that, that we had made um, and were very reluctant to... to I think to face the possibility that one of the one of the expressions of their liberation was killing them. Larry Kramer was telling people to stop having sex. He was saying, just stop having sex for a while, not forever. Just stop right now, and and then let's wait this out and figure out what it is and figure out if there's a cure. Or uh, if you're not going to stop having sex, start having sex with just one person. Just get into a monogamous relationship and do that. Asking people to change their sexual activity, their sexual behavior, right after they have won the right to engage in that behavior on a theory that there might be something going around that's going to kill you, it's tragic to say it, but that was just not going to happen. Anything that told gay men to have less sex or to stop having sex was just inevitably going to be seen as part of that same homophobic message that had been going on for a thousand years. Because the, the recognized authorities, the people we would normally look to, our doctors, public health and so forth, because they were saying nothing and there's this vacuum, there came to be a disbelief in what anybody would say. And so um, a, bar, a, a BAR reporter comes in and does an interview article with me about why safe sex, protected sex, is a good idea. Okay, and. And, so, and then a few days later, some people say, hey, great, great you did that. And other people say, sex Nazi. There was a whole um, controversy about closing the bathhouses, um, which eventually did get closed under Dianne Feinstein. 
Uh, but there was big, you know, there was big discussion about that, and 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 there were there were passionate advocates on both sides about keeping the bathhouses open and educating people about safe sex or closing the bathhouses and and minimizing the possibility of transmission or the counter argument to that was that it would be driving people into having safe unsafe sex or sex in less uh, in places that were less conducive to safe sex like the bushes or or the men's room or whatever. As opposed to looking at bathhouses as a place where maybe we could educate people. Maybe this is where we should go and say, this is what's causing, we think this is what's causing it, and this is what you can do to be safe and to protect people that you care about. Closing them down, that was like stupid. Because, you know, what, what are you going to do about the guys who are going to have sex in the subway or the guys who are going to have sex in Central Park or the guys who are going to have sex on the back steps? I mean, if you don't educate people, clearly you don't really care. I mean, that was the implication of all of those headlines. And you're going to close down bars. Why would you do that? Why not go to the places where people are hanging out and talk to them about this is what we think we can do to save your life? I had done some research, again, on herpes um, in the 70s, showing that condoms, properly used, would block the transmission of the herpes virus. And so I repeated the same thing with the AIDS virus once we isolated it uh, in 1985 uh, with Jay Levy, who was the first American to isolate the HIV virus. And Jay and I did some studies to show that condoms would work. We did not do that for its scientific merit. We did it because you could not talk about condoms on the radio, in television, or in the written press. The New York Times would say, this is a family newspaper. You cannot discuss condoms. And so I thought, you know, the way to get this discussed is to do some science and present it as a scientific issue. And now the press will have to cover it because these doctors in San Francisco have shown that you can block the transmission of this virus, which has now been isolated, with a condom. And sure enough, it worked exactly as planned. The research was clearly contrived. It was true. Every bit of it was true. But it was thought up and, and, and designed so that we could get access to the press to talk about condoms and the transmission of this disease. There are certain things you couldn't do with any federal money, or you couldn't do with any state money. So uh, you couldn't promote, you couldn't do something that they defined as promoting gay sex. Uh, so if we created a brochure that uh, was about safe sex, from the point of view of the federal government, we were promoting sex. Uh, we were promoting gay sex. So at the AIDS Foundation, all the brochures that we made uh, that were about sex were brochures that we funded out of our private fundraising, so out of our donations. And that's one of the reasons we, at the AIDS Foundation, we were able to do what we did because we had all these private donors. I remember we made a uh, bus poster campaign uh, for, for, for condoms. It was the first it was the first public transit uh, posters about condoms at all. And we had to raise all the money privately to, to fund that. The mainstream press did one of the most shameful and disgraceful things in its history in its early coverage of the AIDS epidemic. Its early coverage of the AIDS epidemic was just simply non-existent. It was non-existent. There was nothing in the mainstream press. The first article in the New York Times was months after the epidemic had, the world had been alerted to the epidemic by the CDC. It was on page 18 in a little tiny, nothing little piece. There was a rule in um, many family newspapers that you could not mention the word homosexual. They had a rule against homosexual. You couldn't say homosexual unless you were talking about somebody that was arrested for being homosexual. That was okay. You get arrested in a men's room, 
get your name in the paper and be disgraced. But you couldn't write about homosexuals or the homosexual community in a daily newspaper because little kids would see the word and say, Mommy and Daddy, what's that? So how could you write about an epidemic that was primarily affecting the gay and lesbian population if you couldn't even talk about gays and lesbians? So the coverage was just terrible, non-existent. And that, that really did help to perpetuate the, academic, uh, the epidemic. There were ex exceptions to that. Randy Schultz in the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, here and there, people began to break through. The New York Times finally, the Sunday Magazine section, finally did a big piece, uh, I guess a year later, about AIDS victims, et cetera. But it was very, very sparse at first. And the big breakthrough was in 1985, when Rock Hudson was diagnosed with AIDS. That was the now everyone is at risk moment. That was the beginning of what was called the de-gaying of AIDS when the government began to emphasize that AIDS is not just a gay disease, even though they had known that it wasn't from the very beginning because Haitians and IV drug users and you know people that used blood clotting things got it as well. Um, but that was the moment when they decided they were going to go with that agenda. And suddenly AIDS became just the biggest story in the press. By that time, 50% of all gay men living in major cities were already infected. There was a lot of tremendous misinformation about AIDS once it became a sensational story. And the, the, the general gist of the misinformation really was that everyone's going to get it now. That what just happened to the gay population, where you've got these cohorts that have 40, 50, 60% infected prevalence, prevalence of infection, that is now, over the next five or six years, going to happen to everybody unless people curtail their sexual behavior in a very profound way. Epidemiologists knew that that wasn't the case, that the things that caused the AIDS epidemic in the gay world existed in some heterosexual populations in the world, in Africa, in Thailand, etc., but did not exist in most of the developed world. There were two agendas going on. One was, to, one was on the part of the right wing to scare people into ending the sexual revolution. And the other was on the part of gay people in the left wing to get people to pay attention to AIDS and to fund AIDS and to get a cure. If everyone's afraid they're going to get it, then they'll spend billions and they'll come up with a cure. It fit into both agendas of the left and the right to de-gay AIDS and to overemphasize the risk of the heterosexual population. These sensationalistic stories became much more the staple. Um, there never was an adequate or clear explanation in the mainstream media of why AIDS happened to gay men and what would be needed to contain the epidemic amongst gay men. There never has been to this day. So first of all, there were people who were too sick to do anything and they were worried about staying alive. But also there was a tremendous desire to hide and a fear you know, let's, let's face it, in the early 80s, you had people like uh, William F. Buckley, who was talking about tattooing and, and uh, people with AIDS and putting them in camps um, to protect the general population. The headlines across the tabloids, like the New York Post, were close the bathhouses, close gay bars, quarantine, you know, I mean, those were the, the kind of hysteria that was going on. The idea that all we had to do was put a bunch of gay men in a room and they're breathing on each other and they're going to spread AIDS around. And that was the impression people were giving. I would say virtually every tabloid paper had the perspective that gay people were creating this and spreading it and deserved it. The period of the 60s kind of gave us this patina of, thin patina of free love and progressiveness, which kind of spread across the country. So into the 70s, people were kind of thinking, oh yes, isn't it great, sexual revolution, feminism. But the HIV epidemic really revealed that homosexuality was frightening to people that the idea of individual freedom was frightening to people, and that people were just as homophobic as they'd ever been. The mainstream press was unwilling to really address this, that, hey, this is, no matter what you think of people who are catching this disease, these are your kids. 
And it was not, never presented that way. It was always presented as this almost sensational thing that's happening to those people. People living downstream from Guerneville, which was a big gay uh, resort community, were afraid that, quote, those guys peeing in the river on the weekends are going to infect my grandchildren, and what are we going to do? And as you can imagine, there were people who grabbed that, made headlines out of that, played to that, and it took a state task force that I was chairman of to say, there's no evidence for that, none of these kids are coming down with AIDS, the epidemiological data does not support those fears. But those fears were propagated and, 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 uh, and, and used by uh, particularly the fundamental Christians. All of the churches were letting the fundamentalist carry the water for them. The fundamentalists were dancing on the graves of patients who had died of AIDS. The fundamentalists were writing me letters, I still have some of them, telling me that I was going to be damned in the eyes of God because I was trying to keep people alive who God was clearly punishing by giving them this fatal disease. And who did I think I was to thwart the will of the Almighty? Now you would think, think that the mainstream religions would be from the pulpit saying, Folks, this is a disease. These people, whether you approve of them or not, or disapprove of who they have sex with or how they have sex, these, these are our brothers. These are our children. These are our neighbors. But they didn't do. They didn't say anything. They didn't deny what the fundamentalists were saying. They didn't stand up. There were people, of course, um, and famously Jesse Helms, but so many, I mean, to say that he was he was the only one who would be a gross understatement. Of course, there were so many, many people who thought that this wasn't a bad thing. This might rid the world of all these perverts. And, uh, and that was not a terrible thing. Until ACT was released in 88, there were no medications at all. Um, we barely had things to treat any of the opportunistic infections. When I was in training at Kings County in Brooklyn, um, this was in uh, 83 to 86, we had 5% of all the reported AIDS cases in the entire world in that hospital. Uh, mostly IV drug users and people from the Caribbean. Um, and I remember when pentamidine, which was a treatment for pneumocystis pneumonia, you had to special, you had to call the CDC in Atlanta and then uh, it got so busy that they actually put a locker out at Kennedy Airport, so you had to call them and they would like release some from the locker at Kennedy that would come into the hospitals. And you couldn't even get those drugs to treat opportunistic infections. And there was nothing to treat HIV at all um, until AZT came along. The FDA is the Food and Drug Administration, and there was a sense among um, people with AIDS and people in the gay community that the FDA first had not taken the epidemic seriously enough and now was not approving drugs quickly enough and that there were experimental drugs um, that people were willing to take. You know, people were willing to be guinea pigs um, because we saw what the alternative was. You know, we saw people that without them, people were dying. Um, so we wanted, we wanted the approval process accelerated. We were secluded from the rest, sequestered from the rest of the world, so it was like where we were living it was war and everywhere else it was peacetime and they didn't want to know and that's how we lived. And most of the gay population was in denial about fighting back. Gay men's health crisis had not turned out what I wanted it to be. Not that there wasn't a place for it, but it seemed to be very exclusionary. It was only doing patient services. It was not in any way doing advocacy, which is a polite word for activism. And I had really wanted it to be involved with activism, and it certainly didn't have to be either or. It should have been both. But most of the people that I put on the board, it's very hard to find anybody to go on it in the first place, but most of them were my friends who were nervous. And in the case of Paul Popham, who was uh, our president in the closet. So 
he was not uh, about to either do it himself or be happy when I did it, go out and accuse the mayor of New York of, of being gay. So it, they were nothing but fights for me. And eventually they, they became such that I had to leave the organization. I wrote The Normal Heart, my play, which took up the next couple years and um, was another version of how to get the message out. And then the play being launched successfully, I looked around and saw that things were getting worse and worse and worse and there was still nobody out there being what I called fighting for our lives. There was a call from someone at the Gay Community Center that that Nora Efron had canceled who was supposed to speak and would I come and speak. And so I put all this into a speech and, and uh, about the same time a whole army of Catholics had marched on Albany for some reason or other. And I pointed that out. If, if a bunch of Catholics can go march on Albany, why can't we? Whatever. And, uh, and it was a very emotional meeting. It was a good speech, I guess. And, and, uh, and everybody agreed we had to do something. So we had to start an organization. And we agreed to meet two nights later. And fortuitously, I had been able to place an op-ed in the New York Times called the FDA's callous response to AIDS, which, which detailed some of these things. And the day we had our first demonstration on Wall Street was the very day the Times op-ed piece appeared. So we, got, we were off and running, and we passed that out as we were protesting on Wall Street. And some of our guys got ran and interrupted the evening news and things like that. And so the, the next meeting, Somebody got up and said, we should call ourselves ACT UP. I mean, he figured it AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. He figured it out at the meeting. And so we had our name, and we had our meetings, and we slowly evolved. The greatest thing that the gay population has ever done, if I may say so. Well, it really began with ACT UP, and Larry Kramer gets a tremendous amount of credit for that, of gay men saying, you know, we're, we're going to stand up, and we're going to scream our heads off, and we're going to say, you're not doing anything, and and we're, we're not, we don't want to die. I can remember being at an AIDS meeting in New York that had been called by Al Friedman King, as a matter of fact, at NYU. And uh, there was an article that appeared in a New York rag uh, at the time, written by Larry Kramer, saying, a thousand and counting. And that point, there was a thousand cases. Think of what could have been done, not to stop the epidemic, but to blunt this thing at that point. So Kramer and ACT UP were, were certainly instrumental early on. And here in San Francisco, I mean, we had groups blocking the Bay Bridge at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And of course, everybody in Marin, who's driving back to their, their wonderful little suburb house, were just outraged that they couldn't get home for two hours. And the point that was made by these people the next day in the paper was, well, we're outraged too. We're dying. And you're not doing anything. And you're pissed off because you can't get home and many of us don't have a home to go to. And, and th this was very effective. Uh, there were the Sisters of Perpetual Dull Indulgence who found out Dianne Feinstein by that time was mayor, how she would drive home, and they would wave dildos at her as she drove by <laughs> screaming. <laughs> and, and the senator was understanding, <laughs> but, <laughs> but understandably offended. But they were trying to offend to get, to get the opportunity to sit down and talk about what had to be done. Well, we're famous for our actions, but what made ACT UP work, which is what every successful corporation I'd ever worked for used, the tactics, the, the good cop and the bad cop. And I'd seen that enough working for vice presidents and presidents. You know, there's always one executive who is the nice guy, and there's one executive who's the shit and tell, gives all the bad news to the people you got to pay out money to, while the other guy holds your hand to the creative people. And, oh, he's sorry. Oh, I, so we, that's what we had. You know, the, the, the bad guys were we, the, who were those of us who were out there kicking ass. And then we trained ourselves to be smart enough to go in and, and negotiate inside with 
drug companies and government and stuff. Those people made a tremendous change. One, we could now talk about it, whereas before we could not. We could talk about being gay, which before we could not. You see, the uh, FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, totally changed drug approval process all through the activities of these people. Today, we can bring drugs to market much faster than we could prior to this time. Why? Because they did scream and yell and get into the FDA and say, we're not going to wait 10 years for you to approve this drug. If it shows any benefit at all, we want expanded access. We want it now, and we want it given to people. And we do not want a trial where half of them get placebo and half of them get the drug. We understand the need for statistical significance, but we want 20% to get placebo and 80% to get the drug, and you can still get statistical significance. And it was the gay activist who actually made that point and won at the tables where these decisions were being made. Every single one of those drugs is out there because of ACT UP. You may not know it, but that's why they're there. A lot of guys, a lot of people died to get those drugs out there. We do have treatments that can keep people alive. We do have a much stronger sense that we, we don't get those things unless we fight for them. I also think that the work of ACT UP did influence a lot of uh, the activism and uh, women's health uh, work, including uh, work in the whole breast cancer movement. We were being dumped on as gay people in the 70s and, and going against that. We were being ignored and allowed to, to second and die in the 80s, and people were letting that happen. So there was something clear to go up against. And that continued through the mid-90s. And then with the good medicines, it, um, it settled down. We have not been since then a community with a clear enemy or a, or a clear agenda that has to be carried through. Um, all my life, um, gay has been something you fight for as, and enjoy and get better at and, and, and wonder, about, wonder about and theorize about all these things. Um, but uh, since the mid-90s, for like the last 10 years, 12 years, there hasn't been any of that. And so the guys who are coming out and are in their 20s and in their 30s even um, are guys who came into a gay world where there was the danger of AIDS but not a whole lot of need for activism. Um, and I don't think the wedding, uh, the marriage business is, is really, it's, not, it's just not getting men excited and outraged in the way that those other things would. So the, gay, the, younger, the young gay guys now, even, even the community-minded and activist-minded ones, don't have really something to sink their teeth into externally. When a kid comes out, a young, a young guy comes out now, it's, he's told he's accepted, he's told uh, he has all these rights, he's told everything's going to be okay, but guess what it isn't, because things aren't ever just okay in straight America if you're gay. We always will need uh, some thing, uh, call it a community, call it a affinity groups, affinity, something. We'll always need something for when they do go after us the next time. There always will be a next time. We need to be working on ourselves as a community. We can't just get, we can't just be granted the right to marry and expect we're going to know how to be married because it's different from being not married. While young people never have and never will listen to us older guys, we have an awful lot to say too and we're not all dead either. <laughs>